My name is Ryan Nicholson, and I'm here to discuss, as the title implies, building better cloud detections by hacking, right? It's not really a clickbaity title. It's a very creative title. I like to think so. But we'll, we'll talk about how we can actually, uh, in a safe and secure environment, of course, develop some attacks against a cloud environment with the intention of taking those remnants, those indicators that are left behind, and utilize those in our production environment. You'll see what I'm talking about as we go through uh, the, the slide deck here. Um, really, really quickly, I know I don't like to talk about myself too much if you've been in a SANS course with me before, but uh, just so you know where I'm coming from, uh, I own a company called Blue Mountain Cyber. I'm an author and instructor for SANS for both the SEC 488 course, which I solely author, as well as a course that I co-author with, uh, I got to give all credit to, to Sean, Sean McCullough, the SEC 541 cloud security attacker techniques, uh, monitoring and threat detection, right? It's a, quite the lengthy title. I was going to stop and think about it for a moment. But the uh, reason I bring that up is because this discussion is going to be kind of wrapped and geared around the content that we have in SEC 541. Because in that class, throughout the five days, we're talking about how to spot adversaries in a cloud environment. And this talk specifically is tailored towards AWS as uh, my little subtitle implies here. But just note that as we talk about the overall process and the detection engineering side of things, it could be very, very similar in Azure or GCP or Oracle or Alibaba, you know, choose your vendor, right? Uh, some of the specific attacks though, like the actual tooling used and what these artifacts will look like, of course, will be very AWS specific. So that's where, again, a little more research will be involved on your part to figure out, you know, what would that similar attack or maybe even same attack look like in those types of environments, right? Now I note again, it does say AWS edition. That may imply that I'm building additional of these talks, no promises, but I'm hoping to write an Azure version of this and a Google Cloud Platform version as well. So we'll see, we'll see where that, where that goes. But again, for all intents and purposes, a lot of the process that we talk through this will be largely the same with the various vendors. And I should mention up front because I always wait till way too late in the discussion in in the webcast to mention there is a Q and A at the very end, time permitting. I'll I'll at least answer a few questions, right? But as you're thinking of questions throughout in Zoom, there's a Q and A button you can click on. Chat has been disabled, so use Q and A. Start typing up your questions, and I'll try to keep an eye on them. Again, no promises there either, because I can get on a roll at times. But uh, I will get to them for sure by the end of the session. Again, time permitting. So anyway, let's uh, let's talk about what we're gonna talk about here, or what I'm gonna talk about over the next several minutes. So we're gonna walk through the overall process, the detecting, the detection, excuse me, building process. And we're going to tailor this discussion, of course, to cloud AWS in particular. But the overall, again, the overall process will be very similar, whether you're cloud, on-premise, or a a AWS, or Azure, or GCP, or whatever. Uh, and this is where, after this, it's going to begin to, to kind of spin into the AWS-focused discussions, like what logging should we have in place? Because, again, as we talk about that overall process, logging is going to be a necessity, and it's not just AWS. Many cloud vendors aren't doing us favors with their default logging configuration or, or posture, right? So we're going to have to, as customers, log the right things designed to capture these attacks that we'll be discussing. Now, a lot of the attack, I do not have time to talk all things cloud attacks in just one hour, right? That's what our whole week-long class is all about. And even still, we come up a little bit short, well, quite a bit short. There's a lot of additional techniques that could be leveraged that we just don't have time to cover. I mean, that could easily be a month long class just talking about all the different ways your cloud account could be attacked that we even know of, right? So the overall goal of that class and this talk is to talk about how you can perform those techniques yourself if your intention is to be able to capture those techniques, identify those techniques in your production environment, all right? So we'll see a couple of those attacks. Um, first, attacking the AWS management plane Right, so as you'll find, I'll, I'll demonstrate this in a little bit, a lot of the attack techniques are based around IAM or identity and access management in cloud, right? Again, doesn't really matter on the vendor. Uh, I, I was teaching last week with Alex Bralick, 
uh, German guy, fantastic uh, up and coming instructor. And he, I'm never going to forget this phrase again, like uh, identity is, is king in cloud, right? Because if you have access to cloud credentials, depending on what the permissions that are tied to those credentials, you can get some pretty good impact in that environment as an attacker. So makes sense, of course, to talk to talk and, and, and build the detections for a lot of these authentication related techniques that attackers are leveraging. And I also had the opportunity of sitting in SEC 588, the cloud pen testing course. Again, I learned an awful lot about different ways that cloud accounts are being attacked. And a lot of those attacks were, again, wrapped around identity, right? So again, focusing on many detections there. And even identity can end up on your cloud resources through in AWS's terminology, through the use of roles, right? So we'll talk about how those role credentials can be stolen. You may have come across these examples before, at least some of them. Uh, you may have attended a talk, SANS has done a few of them on IMDS, the Instance Metadata Service. I even wrote a white paper or a blog post all about that. So we'll see that as well as some other techniques where attackers could hijack a cloud service, steal or extract the credentials tied to that service and then use them against you in your cloud environment, right? Now, that's great to know the attacks, but how do we catch it, catch it, right? So we'll be talking about some of the log samples, what that, those breadcrumbs that they're leaving behind during the attack, what that actually looks like in your cloud account, if you're capturing the right data, of course. And that will tie into, of course, building the overall detection. Now you might be thinking, okay, building a detection, are we talking about writing the proper Splunk query? Or are we gonna do this in the cloud native solution like CloudWatch? Or are we just gonna be extracting raw data and sifting through that on the command line? It's gonna be the last example. because For a couple of reasons. One, I don't wanna play favorites with SIM vendors because again, if I talk about Splunk, all the Q radar folks or the Elasticsearch folks be like, what about me, right? Um, but at the end of the, again, at the, at the end of this though, um, to first be able to identify if you can even find the attack, sometimes it's best to go to that raw log, make sure you can you have all the data that you need, you can adequately spot the adversary, and then ship that data over to your SIM to do the, 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 the search query there, right? Depending on what SIM solution you use, right? So again, I'm not playing favorites, and we're going to be working with the raw, unenriched, unprocessed data that may look and feel a little bit different as it ends up in your SIM solution. All right, so that, that's the logic to this. Uh, we can, of course, if we have some time, discuss, you know, how do I get this data to a SIM? Something, again, we do in SEC 541 for very good reason, but that's kind of where we're going to stop with this talk, I believe, unless some questions arise related to uh, getting data imported into your SIM or exported to your SIM, I should say. All right, so big disclaimer right off the bat here. Um, so as the title of the talk implies, to build detections, you may need to attack, right? There for a couple, again, a couple reasons here. The signature may not exist. You may have never seen it before in your environment. So to generate those artifacts, you may have to actually do the attack. With that, I, second bullet's probably the most important of the entire talk. Please do not leverage what I'm about to talk about or anything similar to this in your company's production, AWS account, Azure account, Google Cloud account, whatever, right? Unless you have explicit approval to do so. Maybe you're part of a red team or a pen test team and you wanna test the defenders, right? So maybe you are in fact permitted to launch these attacks. Or maybe again, th there's low risk in your particular environment. So you might be just permitted to perform the attacks to, to learn what those artifacts may look like left behind. But I'm highly gonna stress setting up a sandbox AWS account or cloud account in general, where it's kind of a playground, right? You can put up some realistic our architecture that is operating in production, attack it, see what those remnants look like so that you can build that detection and then to hopefully not, but you know, if the attacker is active in that environment using those techniques, you could spot them performing threat hunting or some future threat detection, right? Depending on again, what tooling you're ultimately using. So again, big disclaimer here, just wanna make sure that we're not running these attacks in an environment that we care about or our company cares about unless we have that express permission to do so. The overall process, and there's like processes within a process here. So I could, again, spend hours discussing each and every one of these, but we'll kind of give the highlights here. Very first and foremost is of course, to just have knowledge about what the attackers are performing, right? Uh, could be tied into your threat intelligence. What are real world attackers performing 
in the wild, right? So you know what to look for. Um, there's a, a wealth of resources out there to help highlight what attackers are doing. Um, my favorite, something we talk about a lot in class in both 488 and 541 is um, MITRE ATT&CK, right? You probably haven't sat through a security talk over the last five plus years without somebody mentioning MITRE ATT&CK, but it's just that wonderful of a platform. All right, I have no vested interest in this. I want to make that very clear. They're not paying me to say that. I just, I love using it day to day because again, it's, it's community driven. It's what real world attackers are performing all compiled into one resource, right? You can learn the different tactics or the, what the attacker is trying to perform, likely many tactics during an attack campaign. And then under those tactics, if you've ever seen one of these matrices, I'll show it in a second, you have a variety of techniques that are performed, right, to support that overall tactic. But not just, you know, what are the attackers doing? Who are they? Who could we likely attribute this work to? So it's tracking some very common attack groups, some advanced persistent threats, nation states, things like that. Um, mitigations are also discussed in there as well. So if you're more on the, you know, prevention and, and quick detection and response, right, the, the blue team, if it were, uh, you have some mitigations for each and every one, well, the, the majority, I should say of those techniques. You can get in front of the attack or identify it very, very quickly and respond adequately. Also discusses some of the software that's in use by these groups as well. Some of it's very purpose-built malware. Some of it's just off the shelf software that you're probably using in your environment today, like PowerShell, right? PowerShell has been huge over the last few years. Uh, that living off the land approach that many attackers may perform. Compromise a Linux or a Windows system and just use the utilities that are already there, right? Uh, just being less noisy, less chance of setting off a network intrusion detection system or even a host-based intrusion detection system, right? So again, probably talk way too much about MITRE ATT&CK, especially if you're very familiar with it, but that's gonna be the main resource that I tend to work with when I'm trying to figure out what real world attackers are doing. So last but not least on that front, I want to pull it over here really quickly and uh, just to show off again, MITRE ATT&CK, they have a variety of matrices. I just simply went to attack.mitre.org and it's M-I-T-R-E.org. Click on matrices and here's your tactics along the top, right? The overall, what are the attackers trying to perform? And it just goes on and on. It's kind of off my screen right now. And then underneath there are a variety of techniques. So we'll see a few of these techniques related to IAM in AWS. Lots of acronyms, by the way, I'm warning you ahead of time uh, as we move forward with this talk, right? I have another tab open here. This is uh, Sigma, right? If you, if you were you know, a blue teamer, you may be very, very aware of Sigma. At the end of this talk, I will have talked about some approaches where we're just doing a bunch of uh, what I call Linux command line Kung Fu. I'm, I'm stealing that term, by the way. I did not invent that term. It just really stuck with me. But that's, to be honest, not the best way to identify threats, right? You're likely gonna wanna get this attack information, these artifacts, over to a single location, whether that's in the cloud vendor environment. Uh, so in AWS's case, maybe in CloudWatch, or if you're an Azure user, Sentinel is the, the hot thing right now in that environment. Or maybe you do send that ultimately to a SIM, right? Sigma is very useful that if you build that detection in a generic language, the Sigma language here, you can use Sigma to translate that into your search for your SIM vendor. And again, notice that one of the SIM options here is Azure Sentinel. So you could write something in their generic language, and then it will show you, here's the Custo query language or KQL syntax to perform that same detection if your data happens to be in Sentinel, if that's where you're doing your investigation and detection and so on, right? So after we've done the research of the technique, next would be, of course, to establish proper logging. Now, this is where, again, there's gonna be a lot of trial and error in some cases if you're not fully aware of, if I do this thing, what artifact will be generated? Because again, cloud vendors aren't doing us a whole lot of favors, at least by default, when it comes to logging. They give you the capability, don't get me wrong, in many occasions, it's just knowing where to turn the thing on, what that data is going to represent as part of that attack, and just turning it on, first of all, right? Just, just turning the right log source on um, and configuring it properly to send to the right locations. Again, we'll, we'll talk to that a little bit here in this talk. Uh, and then, of course, we attack, right? Now that the logging's in place, let's attack as a real-life attacker would so we can generate that data and then build detections based upon that data. So that's our life cycle. That's our process. 
Now, again, there's, there's processes within processes because when I say set up proper logging, well, what does that mean, right? I, I just mentioned some real easy ones like turn on logging, right? If you want to capture, let's say, uh, access attempts to your S3 buckets. Well, what's not on by default is S3 access logging, server access logging, they call it. We well, can turn that on. But what if I want more context? What if I want to strip out fields that I would never in a million years care about, right? There are, there's, there are some enrichments and uh, minimization techniques that you can take to just get the data that you ultimately will use for a security or possibly even an operations purpose. So can we spend many, many hours talking about that engineering side of the house as well. So again, I'm being a little vague with some of these processes, but we're going to walk through a few examples of generating these detections. All right. So as I discuss, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a technology, right? A technology that's in use in cloud, how it's probably supposed to be used. We'll talk about the attack, like what the attackers, how they are using this to their advantage or how they're attacking this, this feature, this, this functionality. And then of course, what log data is necessary and then how to detect these shenanigans in our cloud account, AWS in particular. So first and foremost, we have how humans and their tools access Amazon Web Services, right? Now, there's a variety of ways to authenticate with AWS, but some tried and true techniques are logging in with your web browser, right? So visiting the management console, right? Uh, I believe it's console.amazonaws.com, something like that. I have it bookmarked. I haven't memorized. I haven't had to type that out in quite some time. Uh, or using uh, a command line tool or an application, right, through what's called an access key and secret access key pair. Right. Think of it, although it isn't, but think of it like a username and password, right? Just for your applications, right? Some secrets that your application uses to prove to AWS, I am legitimate. I am this user. Therefore, any requests I make with these credentials and, and signed requests and all that good stuff that comes along with that, it's legitimate. And as long as I have the right permissions tied to this user account that I'm proving to be, all as well, right? If I don't, then of course I'll have those error conditions like you don't have rights to this or invalid access key, things like that, right? But those are the two main ways. Now, some of the attacks we'll talk about, I've used this, right? Like if you're using the management console with just username and password, stop doing that, right? Because some of these techniques could very likely be successful. But if you start going down the path of multi-factor authentication, which I'm sure a lot of us are, at least I hope so, uh, or some of the single sign-on solutions to maybe, uh, at, like you know, at time like at, at time of request, generate these access and secret access key pairs, and they're only valid for a short amount of time. Those can help defeat a lot of these techniques that we're going to talk about over the next few slides here. So, just want to throw that out there. But I will tell you, there's many organizations I've worked with in the past that are still struggling with MFA single sign-on. So attackers may still be leveraging this, these techniques. And even if you are, by the way, set up for MFA, set up for single sign-on, and you're doing a lot of the mitigations that we'll also discuss here and there, um, still wouldn't be a bad idea to detect these behaviors in your account. That way, at the very least, you know you're being targeted by somebody. Like you, you can get some additional information about that attacker, maybe see where else they might be in your account. Yeah, you've stopped them here, but did you stop them from accessing cloud storage or attacking your virtual machine or whatever the case may be, right? So not a bad idea to build these detections, even though you're sure you have the proper mitigation in place, right? That's come back to bite us in the industry many times. Like we, we've had the prevention device, we've got the firewall, right? It's gonna solve all of our problems. So why turn on logging? Why do detection? The firewall's got it handled until it doesn't, right? So never hurts to have additional detection if you have the, the human resources and the, uh, to, to analyze the data, of course, or the tooling or the storage, all that good stuff, right? So I just want to highlight the importance of still doing detection, even though you're doing those things. So how do we log some of these attacks? So when it comes to AWS, when you authenticate, when you send an API call, for the most part, there's a few that are not captured by default. I'll get to that in a second. You're going to be leveraging AWS CloudTrail to review that data, at least first and foremost. Like that's on by default in your account. Right, so nearly all API calls are going to be captured and stored for 90 days, right? Because cloud is very API driven. So logging into the console, there's an event called console login, right? So if you fail, it will show up as a failed action, a failed API call. If it's successful, it'll show as successful as well. And also provide some context around that login. Like 
what IP address made the request? What user agent or application were they likely using? Got to make that very clear, thanks to Moses Frost and one of his latest, I believe it was the Off by One podcast, uh, uh, excellent session that I watched uh, where attackers, uh, some tooling that attackers are using is rotating through a bunch of user agents to try to evade some of the conditional access policies in Azure. Very interesting stuff. Can't say enough good things about that talk. I learned a ton in the process. But in a perfect world where attackers are not spoofing what their application is, that that would be a, a decently reliable uh, source, right? For a, a benign user, let's say, right? A non-malicious user and much more, right? Was it successful? Was it not? What was the event name of this request? And so much more is captured in this service. Now I did say that most of the data is captured by default, but not all. And the data is only there for 90 days. So what if you're running down an investigation that was a year old, where's the data? Well, if you're not creating what are called trails to export that data to a long-term storage, like an S3 bucket, or to CloudWatch, or maybe downstream to your SIM solution, whatever you happen to be using, you're going to be missing the data. It, it is very strict. That data is only there for 90 days, right? The other thing was, the uh, I kind of uh, skipped over it, but um, not all the data is being stored. So what do I mean by that? Well, AWS breaks these events into what they call management events, data events, and insights events. Management events are what are on by default. Generally speaking, couldn't find a really good definitive answer to this other than some examples. Generally speaking, if you're manipulating a cloud resource or reading from a, a cloud resource, like I want to list all of my buckets, right? That's a management action, right? That's a single action causing a change or maybe not causing a change against a cloud resource, or I'm creating a virtual machine, or I'm deleting a DynamoDB database, like the cloud resource itself. Those are considered management events. Those again are logged by default. What about the other stuff? What if, what if I write an object into an S3 bucket? I'm not necessarily manipulating the bucket itself, I'm adding data to it. Or I'm writing or reading an entry from DynamoDB, or I'm triggering a Lambda function to run. I'm not changing the function or even describing information about the function, I'm just saying run, right? Is that gonna be captured? Well, in all likelihood, no, because they're considered and AWS's terminology, data events. To capture those though, you can turn them on. You have to configure again that, that trail and define that not only do I wanna capture management events, I also wanna capture these particular data events as well for these particular services, right? So you have to turn that on. And I don't wanna speak for Amazon, but I assume that's probably because those services tend to be very noisy, right? Especially if you've served like web content from an S3 bucket, and your website is very, very busy, all of those read actions of all of those objects, if that was captured in CloudTrail, that would just, not that you can probably fill up that service, but it'll create a, an enormous amount of log data that otherwise, that now again is not on by default. You would have to enable that through a trail. And I did say there were three. The third one is insight events. Uh, that is a technique in which CloudTrail can help identify abnormal write events inside of your AWS account. It does take some time to learn your environment. You can't pick out abnormal without knowing normal first, right? So if your users are behaving normally over a period of time, and then there's a change in your environment or a right API call being performed that's abnormal enough for you, the customer, it will point those things out for you as well. But again, you have to turn on this trail to be able to capture that data. Right, so that's probably way too much on CloudTrail, but just showing its importance on how we can identify attacker movements and behaviors in AWS just with this one single service. We'll cover some others as well because it might not always be an API call that the attacker is performing against your account. So now the attack, actually a few attacks. Uh, management console login, All right? Pretty straightforward, right? It's an authentication attack against your human users, we'll call them, right? Those that are logging in with their web browser to the AWS management console. Now, got big red letters here. This technique is not recommended for pen testers. Do attackers care about what I say about being not recommended or do they care about Amazon's customer service policy for penetration testing, which as you can see here, says no to login request flooding or API request flooding, they don't care. Pen testers, you might want to care about this because you could lock yourself out of Amazon. You could get banned. That's just no good, right? 
There is a tool for it though. So again, with that out of the way, there is a tool called Go AWS Console Spray from White Oak Security that does just that. It will take, and, and, and the name is misleading, I must say. If you're familiar with a password spray, and you've probably heard this in many talks before too, but I'll, I'll keep it short. It's where you try a bunch of usernames, a bunch of hopefully legitimate usernames for a target organization. Uh, a technique to get those usernames might be, you know, go to their LinkedIn page for the for the company, see who claims to work for them, try to find an email address, figure out how they create their usernames, is it first initial, last name, and so on. Generate that list for all of those users. And then try to attack with a single password that one of those users will very likely use. All right, password spray was, I believe, originally designed to prevent password lockouts or account lockouts, I should say. You know, where if you try three, you get locked out. Well, unfortunately, in AWS, unless you're using an identity as a service provider in tandem with AWS, there is no lockout policy, unfortunately. Now, that's not to say that AWS won't recognize really strange uh, malicious behavior against their account and maybe do something about it. But from the customer's perspective, uh, password spray, I, I'm not aware of a really good defense against the IAM console, right? It, it will be more, of course, responding to it very, very quickly. Okay. Um, oh, and why this is misleading. I, I knew I was going somewhere with this. So why the name is misleading is this is an, a, a, just a general AWS management console attack tool. You can provide a list of users and a list of passwords or a single user and a list of passwords, do that dictionary style attack, right? But I imagine originally designed for a password spray. So that ended up in the name, right? So again, do not do this if you're a pen tester. Again, even if you're building detections in your own account, I do not recommend doing this unless you keep it very, very light, right? Because who knows what Amazon means by login request flooding? Is it Does that mean 100 logins per minute? Is it 1,000 per minute? Is it 10 per minute? Really don't know. So I did some of this work for you, but I, I did a very, very, very small. So please, if you work for Amazon, don't report. I'm just joking. Uh, I didn't get blocked. So I'm assuming this was okay. I actually performed it just to create the data for you so you don't have to do it. So I ran that tool. But if you look very closely, I only ran, you can see here, eight login requests. I had a list of eight users. I just I chose a few folks from the cloud curriculum as, as the name for my account. And then I used a, a password that I knew one of my users was configured for. And you can see the user in this case was, was Ryan. Of course, very, <laughs> very easy to tell who had the weak password or the guessable password here by this attacker, which was, of course, also me. But I, I, did, it, I did it for a couple of reasons. One, again, I wanted to see what these requests would look like. But also, I want to see a successful password spray. How could I identify that amongst the data, right? Generally speaking, of course, attackers are more crafty than this in a lot of cases. If you're seeing many, many requests in your log data, and we'll see what the log data looks like in a moment, um, in a short amount of time, most of them failing, maybe one or two of them being successful, again, from the same IP, same user agent or collection of IPs and collection of applications, it's very likely that this was a password spray and that it was successful. Again, you can see in this result of the attack tool that I was successful with one of these passwords against this poor Ryan user. All right. Again, that's go AWS console spray. Just want to mention it one more time. If you joined late, do not run this attack. You may get blocked by AWS because you're break, you're literally breaking their, their user policy. If you make this noisy enough. Again, I, I, I think I kept it sane. I kept it to eight users, but your mileage may vary. I don't know what that firm number is. Maybe AWS will let us know someday, right? All right, so now let's pivot and talk about the detection. We'll do this a few more times, by the way, going through this, this cycle. So detecting the console password spray, you can see here, if you're re reviewing this data in the uh, CloudTrail service itself, you will go under what they call the event history. Now, again, this is assuming that you have access to this data in the service. So you have 90 days of data there. If you were exporting this data to S3 or CloudWatch, of course, this will look quite a bit different because you're going to be using CloudWatch logs insight queries probably to access that data, to sift through that data. Or if it's an S3, you're going to have to be exporting that to another location to be able to extract those events and slice and dice that data. So we got lucky here. The data is in CloudTrail and we can see some of the results. And interestingly enough, username hidden due to security reasons. That's interesting. And it's the first I've seen it, to be quite honest, at least for this style of attack. Um, I 
assume, and I, I, again, I have no back, I have no knowledge of this. I researched it in AWS as documentation and kind of came up empty other than saying, yeah, for security reasons, we put that in there. <laughs> My guess is if you've ever logged into an Amazon management console before, you either will go through logging in as the root user. Please don't do that on a regular basis. Maybe an initial creation, because that's a very powerful user. Um, so you should, of course, be working towards least privilege. The most likely way, though, you're going to be using the management console is to log in as an IAM user, where there's three fields. The first field is going to be your AWS account number or ID. Second field is going to be your username. Third field is a password. How many of you, or is it just me, accidentally typed your password in a user field before or accidentally typed your credit card number in the wrong field, right? You're supposed to be in the field down below, but you put it one and an additional field for whatever reason, right? Again, I can't speak for AWS, but I suspect that might be part, maybe part of the reason why they hide the username if it's not a valid username for your account. So if I accidentally type my password, I won't see it here. Uh, but this, this is because those users do not exist in my account. Right. There was there was Eric for Eric Johnson, there was Sean for Sean McCullough, there was Moses for Moses Frost, Frank for Frank Kim, and a few others. Uh, I apologize if I left you all out um, that were not part of my account, yet were included in that password spray. So another good indicator that we might have some really strange authentication behavior inside of my account. Right? Again, you see this hidden due to security reasons, or maybe you just see a flurry of login requests in a short amount of time. If you notice the timestamp here, it's all happening at 712 and either 34 or 35 seconds. That's an awful lot of logins. Maybe we just opened the doors to the building. Everyone sat down at their desk at the same time and everybody logged in at once. That's probably not very likely. So probably some kind of automated attack is being performed here, right? Here's the other way you could find this. So you'll see a lot of this in 541 where we try to add efficiencies where necessary, but right off the bat, we mentioned, if you're not comfortable on the command line, it's going to be a bit daunting. It might be a bit overwhelming, but again, it's there for a reason. It's to be as efficient as possible, help in the creation of writing scripts to automate these tasks later on. And also just know that, yes, I can, from a, a, a programmatic perspective, be able to generate a detection based upon some kind of known attacker technique or behavior that we had performed in class even, right? So we're doing the same thing here. Again, it looks very cryptic, but at the end of the day, we're running this AWS CloudTrail lookup events command. And what we're doing is looking specifically, and that's what line two is all about here, specifically for any console login events, right? Now, of course, you're going to see an awful lot of data coming back. If you've ever seen the output of these tools, by default, it's going to be in JSON format, JavaScript object notation, it gets incredibly noisy, lot, walls of text showing up on the screen, not very intuitive to read, right? You'll be going page after page after page trying to dissect this. So there's a utility that works wonderfully with JSON to slice and dice that data for you, get to exactly what you're looking for, and that's JQ. So what I'm doing, and that's lines three through five here, is I'm extracting just the data that I'm interested in. I'm interested in when the event happened, the username that logged in, and the console login itself. So again, just get highlights, highlights of that information here. Was it successful or was it not successful? All right, so let's see what that looks like. And there you go. So as you can see, timestamps are very telling that we have an automated tool in place. Now, one additional command I like to see when I'm trying to look at maybe an authentication attack is sort the time in uh, ascending order. That way I can see from oldest to newest. That's just a preference that I have. But if you read the opposite, that's totally fine too. But this is sorted in uh, descending order. But in either case, it's all within the same second or two. Many failures. One success in the middle, though. So not only does it look like some kind of authentication attack, maybe a password spray due to the changing in usernames, we have a success in the mix there as well, right? So looking like we do have a successful attacker, right? And uh, I, I am trying to keep an eye on the question, so I'll, I'll hit it now for you, uh, Musab. Is there a way to get where the source IPs for these login requests are? Yes, um, that I'm just hiding it right now because part of that event, as I mentioned before, would include things like user agents, source IP addresses, uh, was it successful, was it not successful, what was the event, and, and much, much more, right? Did they log in with MFA or not? All kinds of data, dozens of fields of data, including source IP. So that's maybe something we could also add to this JQ query. Also show me the source IP address related to this attack. And due to screen real estate reasons, was not included here. Plus, I didn't want to show what my 
IP address was because I don't want to be attacked. <laughs> Something we joked about last week when I taught because I, I did happen to have my IP address in some of the slides in 541. So every time we get to that slide, like do not attack this IP, please. So I just want to, <laughs> I'm trying to do my best to avoid you know, exposing my IP address. All right. Oh, it looks like my little uh, apologies for that. It looks like my box moved a little bit. That's supposed to be wrapped around the Ryan user. I'll get those slides fixed uh, before they're put out on the webcast page. But uh, I think you can make sense. That, yeah, I'm just I'm down one entry there. My mistake on that one. So what about the programmatic users, though? We just talked about usernames and passwords, lack of MFA, things like that. What about those applications that need access to AWS? And we're providing them with access keys and secret access keys. You saw the regex if you're looking closely a few slides ago on like access keys, for example, are going to be all capital letters and numbers 20 characters long. Secret access keys are going to be 40 characters long, and they're going to be mixed case. They're going to be numbers. There's going to be some special characters in there as well, right? At the end of the day, anything that's base 64 friendly will be included as a secret access key, because I believe it's some random hex that's just base 64 encoded. But in any case, can an attacker just guess these? Probably not. If you're familiar with uh, Steve Gibson, if you've subscribed to the Security Now podcast, excellent, by the way, also accounts for CPEs. Uh, continuing education credits. Just want to throw that out there. Um, I do want to mention that he has this uh, passwords haystacks on his website that now these numbers are dated. I will admit this site has been around for quite some time, like probably early 2000s when these calculations were made. So when we say things like uh, a massive cracking array, that's a massive cracking array, probably from like 2002, 2005, sometime in there. But I, just, I still want to show the impact because even that technology of back then, I think these numbers are staggering enough that attackers are not going to be able to brute force these, especially in an online scenario. So to simply correctly guess the access key ID, right? And remember, it's a pair. You got to have that and the secret access key. So I'm no wizard at math. I'm not going to attempt to figure this out. But to just guess the access key ID, according to the site, would take you 4.37 million trillion centuries to actually guess that on average, right? So that's not likely to happen in, in any of our great, 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 great grandkids' lifetimes, right? You know, we're several, several, you know, centuries away. Um, and the secret access key is even worse. It's uh, in an online attack scenario, 11 and a half trillion, 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 trillion centuries to be able to guess that. And again, it's a combination of these two. So it's exponentially, 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 and so on, gonna be more time required to brute force these. Attackers aren't doing this. They're not going to do this. So they're not going to try all A's as an access key and all A's as a secret access key and then move to the next one, right? If they are, you're probably safe from that attacker. I just got to say, right? If they're not doing things the best way they can. But these credentials are often sought after. So let's say they compromise a virtual machine. Maybe your virtual machine has a vulnerable application. It's compromised. The attacker gets a presence on that system. And that system happens to have these credentials, these access and secret keys configured somewhere on the system, right? Commonly, if you're using the AWS CLI tools, you'll have a .AWS directory in your home directory, your user home directory with a credentials file, right? And they're in plain text. They're, they're not otherwise protected other than disk permissions, right? File system permissions. Um, also, we see this way too much. There was a study done by North Carolina State University some years back with Cisco that found hundreds of thousands of secrets, including cloud credentials, in a public-facing GitHub repository, right? That's just one source code vendor, right? One version control system. And that's only public-facing ones. Imagine what the rest is looking like. You know, GitLab or uh, Bitbucket or Amazon has their own, right? They have code commit. In fact, if attackers get access to those repos, they could discover cloud credentials there as well. So how do I identify that these credentials, if stolen, are being used? Well, CloudTrail will rescue us here. Uh, we'll also see, let's say we have a misconfiguration. Let's say we have a, an S3 bucket that's public facing, or maybe we're doing that on purpose, right? Because that may make some of you shudder a little bit. Like I've heard buckets being exposed as a bad thing. It's commonly used though to share data. Like you can turn an S3 bucket into a website. So if someone accidentally pushes these credentials to a file on that web server, whether it's an S3 bucket or not, these S3 access logs could identify that that particular file is being accessed in, in, inside of that inside of that bucket. All right, so let's look at this. Um, stealing overexposed credentials, all right? So we're just going to assume here, developer accidentally pushed their .aws directory along with 
their web code, right? If you've ever ran a web server facing the internet and paid any attention to access logs, probably within minutes of that thing going online, you're going to see web crawls happening. You're going to see tools that are discovering your web server, and they're going to see if any files of interest exist. So I'm seeing more frequently now these requests looking for a .aws slash credentials file or a .azure slash msal underscore token underscore cache.json file, which includes bearer token information for Azure or the .config slash, I believe it's credentials.db for Google Cloud, right? They're looking for these things. So let's assume they find it, right? How would I identify that? Well, first the attack, right? Uh, how, how they could find it, like GoBuster, right? GoBuster is a wonderful tool for attackers, of course, or security researchers to submit a word list against a web server looking for files of interest, right? So I cut this off because there was just hundreds and hundreds of lines here. So that's the execution of the GoBuster in dir mode. You provided a word list and a target. Right. And I also suppressed any errors just to clean up the, the uh, output a little bit. And then I got some results. Right. Um, there were some strange 400 errors, which more or less say, hey, client, you're, you're doing it wrong. Right. From the server. I think this is not a valid request. But I had some 200 OKs coming back, which tells me that most likely that file does, in fact, exist. So as an attacker, if I see .aws slash config and credentials, Someone probably set up the AWS CLI on that system, and that file is inadvertently, those files are inadvertently exposed to me. So I'm going to go grab that, right, and try to see if those credentials are still valid. In all likelihood, they are, unless they rotated those credentials, because these are long-lived credentials. They're not temporary. I guess you could configure temporary credentials in there as well. But in all likelihood, we'll just say they're probably valid, right, if they, if they weren't aware of them being exposed or just didn't do the best practice of rotating them on a regular basis, right? So I'm just highlighting them there. There's all the files we found. Again, two are gonna be very valuable to the attacker. And to continue the attack, we use them, right? So just go down, just to download those files. So visit the URL that GoBuster said, hey, there's something interesting here. And then you use those credentials, right? So you don't have to have a credentials file in AWS to use credentials with tools. Uh, the AWS CLI and many others are smart enough that to say, like, if you have some environment variables configured or in line with your request, uh, with your command, I should say, it's going to prefer those over what's in your credentials file and also over whatever's in IMDS. More to come on that in a little bit where you're supplying roles to your system. So it will preferably choose these credentials, right? So it's not that I had credentials configured. It's that I'm using the stolen ones here to run a command, describe instances. So some discovery style attacks very common, not just in cloud. Like once you get a foothold in an environment, maybe you stole some credentials. We'll see what those credentials give you. See where I can go from here. Enumerate, if you will. So that's an example here of doing just that. What instances are available in this account? Next up is detecting that web crawl that happened in the first place. When I ran GoBuster, how do we find that? Well, again, these tools tend to be very noisy. The attacker's trying to automate a flurry of attacks, unless they're super low and slow, of course. If it's a nation state, if it's an advanced persistent threat, if it's a red team engagement, a, a, a no kidding red team engagement that lasts several months, they're, they're not going to be likely running tools like this. Or, or if they are, they're going to slow it down to a crawl. It might be like a request, wait five minutes. A request, wait seven minutes. You know, Add some, uh, some jitter in there as well. Just kind of blend in a little bit, not be as easily discoverable. But if you run GoBuster in its default state, you're going to see, again, a flurry of requests coming from hosts very, very quickly, right? And in fact, we see those requests here in our web logs here. These are our S3 access logs. We see that 200 response code for a very sensitive file, .aws credentials. So maybe something to hunt for in your server data, looking for credentials, looking for MSAL token cache if you're in the Azure world, or anything credentials related, along with a 200 OK message or something of that nature to say it looks like this was successfully downloaded by the attacker, right? Um, I missed this from a few slides ago. I just want to hit it now because it's been staring me in the face. <laughs> but uh, Saya Feek, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, how the attacker get the account ID on AWS? Good question. Uh, maybe, maybe through their reconnaissance, they were able to discover that particular account ID. That would be something that the attacker would have to get access to before they start launching those management console style attacks. Maybe that was exposed in source code somewhere. Maybe there's a config file that they found that referenced that account ID, right? They would. So not only would they have to guess the username and password, 
they would have to know ahead of time your account ID. So very good question. I, I probably glossed over that. I apologize. All right. So let's move into the cloud VM itself, right? Uh, VMs, along with uh, Lambda functions, we'll talk about two pretty quickly here. Those can be supplied um, credentials as well through, through, through cloud, right? So again, many of these techniques that we'll discuss, just attackers can leverage to access these credentials on these systems in these cloud resources as well, right? Along with the tried and true methods of before, you know, so successful social engineering engagements, uh, password guessing, as we just saw, maybe even a passwords.txt laying around in a place that it shouldn't be. So to detect those sorts of things, right, uh, we have, along with the role access that we'll see here in a, in a bit, like I said, CloudTrail will come in handy once more, as well as local system logs for those virtual machines, or if you can do logging in Lambda as well to be able to capture those interactions that are happening in those very dynamically spun up environments, right? And also, if the attacker is using your cloud infrastructure against you, like systems manager has a component called run command, which if they have rights to perform run commands on all of your VMs, they may not even have access to your VM to like SSH into it or remote desktop into it. They could execute run commands against your system via API calls to run commands locally as a root user, by the way, these run as root in AWS and Azure. I know that for a fact, right? There was some, maybe some pen testing that I may have done with that. And it was very, very successful. So let's look at the, a variety of attacks which can steal credentials from that local system, right? First is by abusing what is called user data, right? Now, not gonna be a guarantee that credentials are stored in this mysterious thing called user data, but user data is used uh, when a, a system is first spun up, typically, it's going to read these instructions, typically a script. Uh, you can also use a tool called cloud init. So a cloud commit, cloud init YAML configuration to say, here, configure yourself in this way. You can often use by ops teams to make that system unique in comparison to the other systems, or maybe make some last minute configuration changes. Well, that data is still retrievable, right? After it's been executed. Unless, and there is a step you can fix this, you clear out user data and reboot the system. So there is a little bit of downtime to kind of get in front of this or remedy it very quickly. But you know, if attackers look here in this user data while it's available, they could get access to some very, very sensitive details. And we'll see a few different techniques to perform this. First is going to be accessing IMDS. So if you have a compromised host, which I'm going to just simply mean the attacker has a presence on that host, or they can execute commands from that host and retrieve the results, they can interface with this instance metadata service, right? So the instance metadata service, and this is across at least, and it's probably similar in others, AWS, Azure, and GCP, is this IP address, 169.254.169.254. It's an IP address that's reachable by every single cloud system. And the data that it's getting back is unique to that system or the cloud environment in which that system is running, right? So if you go to the, the path that you see here, slash latest slash user data, you will get in plain text, the user data that was supplied to that system, again, typically at launch time. So if you look closely, you can see a cloud init config. Part of that config is a plain text, don't recommend plain text, but it's there anyway, <laughs> plain text password for this local VM user. So now the attacker could legitimately access the system if SSH is exposed to them, being that this is a, a Linux system, likely how we're managing it here. Now, of course, if you're using cloud config or cloud init, you don't want to use a plain text password. You want to have a salted hashed password. That way, yes, the attacker could still acquire it, but then they have to break the password to actually use it, right? And you know, salted passwords help with rainbow table attacks and things like that, right? So it's just a much stronger approach, <laughs> uh, exponentially stronger than having a plain text password just sitting there waiting to be stolen, right? Now, when it comes to the API, so, so assuming the attacker has the permissions to perform run commands against your system. So it's assuming the attacker does not have local access on the system in which IMDS would be a much easier approach. They could execute some API calls against your AWS account. If again, the stolen credential gives them the proper rights to execute run commands. So in doing so, see a four line long command here, going out and grabbing the user data, which is in base 64, it's, it's base 64 encoded, which is why you see the base 64 dash capital D because I'm on a Mac in this example, lowercase d if you're on a Linux system. And you can see that it's just the same. 
It's just like I interacted with IMDS, right? Will these attacks work if the user is using a temporary access key? Yes, if they haven't expired yet. Right? Typically, temporary access, again, in general, it varies by vendor. We'll say hours at the most, eight hours, maybe 24 hours, worst case. But once they rotate, the attacker's going to have to steal them again, right, to get the fresh set of credentials. Another, and that was from Jim. And we have from Ali here is uh, CloudTrail able to log all attacker recon activities. If it's, if it's an API call, that's what CloudTrail is logging, right? It is not logging. Like, let's say, for instance, they compromise your system and they're scanning from that system, or even they're, they're scanning over the network, targeting your systems. CloudTrail is not responsible for that data. It's not going to be there. There are other services for that, though. And there, there's going to be like a NetFlow logging. Well, I, I said that wrong. Apologies, Cisco. There's flow logging available in AWS to see those network interactions. There's traffic mirroring for full packet capture to send to your analysis tools to look for those, uh, those behaviors as well. But yeah, CloudTrail is just for API logging, right? Very good question. All right, moving on. Running short on time. I don't want to rush through this too fast, though. Uh, so here is the, uh, the other half of the run commands. Because you may have noticed um, here, oh, sorry, I apologize. This was not the run command. I got a little bit ahead of myself. This on the right of this last slide, because you might be looking like, where's run command at? <laughs> this is assuming the attacker has the describe instance attribute API call, right? Which you can just directly recover the user data. Here is the run command. Again, apologies for that. The run command is a bit lengthy. It's a bit of command line Kung Fu, but it's essentially the same thing, trying to read something on the host or trying to execute a command on that host. And the command is different here. Here, I'm trying to access a local user password from the uh, Etsy shadow file, right? Now, again, it's not going to be the plain text password anymore. It's going to be a salted hashed password. But again, the attacker could take that, try to crack it, and then try to use it otherwise. But when you run run commands from the command line, you say, hey, AWS, please run this for me. You wait a little bit, and then you have to make a follow-on request asking for the result. So that's why you see two commands here, the AWS SSM send command and the AWS SSM list command invocation, which goes and retrieves those results. And there you can see, which is blacked out, my salt that we can see the salt, but you can't see the salted hash here, right? But it's recoverable now. And they can try to crack it with, John the Ripper, or you know, whatever tool they want to use, Hashcat, whatever tool they want to use at this point. So how do we detect this, right? CloudTrail, to some degree, will show us this. So on the left, you see uh, the API calls being made by, or, or sorry, uh, the, the one for the accessing the user data instance attribute. So you can see what's being requested here. But unfortunately, in this log data, you don't see what was returned to the attacker. Right? You just see the request itself. So Look for this. Look for, look for any attempts to access user data from an API perspective. If they're not legitimate, typically, in your environment, would make for a very, very good detection. Same with run commands. You can see the request. And this is the other time I saw hidden due to security reasons. Because with these commands, there might be some sensitive data in those commands, maybe a, a password being supplied legitimately to the command. So that's scrubbed from the log data here as well. So not only do you not see the results coming back, directly, you would have to go somewhere else to find them, which I'll get to in a moment. You don't see the actual command that was being executed on that system, right? So speaking of the result, if you go into the SSM command history, there's the output of that command. So you can at least here see what's being provided back to the attacker, right? Let's see, is it recommended to remove, and this is from Ali as well, uh, KMS logs generated in CloudTrail to save cost? Um, what attacks cannot be detected if we remove KMS logs? So two things, CloudTrail and deleting data in the service, not a thing, right? You cannot turn off logging. So that 90 days worth of data, it's there to stay, right? So can't do that. But if you're saving that data as trail data in CloudWatch or in S3, you could certainly, if you feel that that data can be risky, there's invocations and requests surrounding those invocations. And certainly you can manually delete that data there or just choose not to collect it in those trails whatsoever. But it, unfortunately, it's going to be in the cloud trail service if it's logged there for 90 days. All right, last but not least, coming down to the wire here, we have attached roles. So again, AWS, you can use roles to supply permissions to various cloud resources. I'm not naming them all here, I'm just gonna focus on two, EC2 instances and Lambda functions. 
In EC2 instances, if you're an attacker, you're going to target likely the IMDS service. Um, just like we saw with user data, you can also retrieve credential information from that system, for that system, I should say. Uh, Lambda, these credentials are supplied as environment variables. So if you can execute, say, the env command inside of a Lambda function, because at the end of the day, it is a micro VM, as Amazon puts it, running your code. If your code is buggy, vulnerable, what have you, an attacker can hijack that code, or worse yet, write their own Lambda functions. Maybe they have permissions to do that attach a role of their choosing, and then steal the credentials for that role to escalate privileges, right? So it's very, very interesting ways of making way with uh, cloud credentials. So we'll see those examples here. First, if you're on a system or you can trick the system into accessing IMDS, it's going to be a two-step process to actually get the credentials, unless somehow you know the name of the role, in all likelihood you don't as an attacker. So that first path we're looking at, latest metadata, IAM security credentials, that will divulge what the name of the role is attached to this system, right? Next step is just simply append the name of the role to the end of that previous command. It'll be slash inspector role in this example, something we use in class. It's a, in 541, it's a Sherlock theme. So it's inspector and Sherlock and Moriarty and all that good stuff. Kind of stole that terminology here from class. But once you submit that second request, boom, access key, secret access key and token. Uh, I love that someone brought up the uh, the um, temporary credential, right? If it's temporary, can you still use it? Yes, you can. What's not pictured on the slide here down below, it's kind of ripped off the page, if you will. You'll see an expiration date. That's when that credential is no longer valid to AWS. So as an attacker, if that's looking to be very soon or I can't get my work done in that amount of time or I need to steal them again, I'm going to have to steal them again. I'm going to have to rerun that second step because I already know the name of the role. That's not going anywhere unless they change it for whatever reason. And I'm going to re-steal the credentials and have a you know another eight hours or so to get access to AWS as that user. Right? Lambda is a little more tricky as I note here. The, the function has to be vulnerable to some kind of attack, the code that is, or the attacker has to have rights to create a function and maybe be able to attach roles to functions in particular. Right? So it's a very specific scenario. But in either case, if the attacker gets a presence inside of that execution environment, they could steal environment variables, right? So the function that you see here is one that I created for evil purposes to simply trigger the Lambda function to divulge all of its environment variables. And you can see, if you look very closely, you see two of the three that you need here, the AWS session token, which I didn't black out because it runs way off the screen. It's very long. And the AWS secret access key. Also included there will be the access key, that, that third piece. So very similar approach to EC2 once they're stolen. Just, just use them, right? Provide them to the attack tools and off of the races you go. So detecting it in EC2 gets a little tricky because, again, we're assuming the attacker has a presence on that system or there's a vulnerable application doing the bidding for them. So we have to have adequate logging on system hopefully feeding up to our SIM or wherever else we might uh, be better off analyzing that data instead of doing it on system, although we could, right? Or maybe it's a, a vulnerable application, a web application. So maybe that web application is logging some of those interactions for us to see evidence of IMDS being accessed. So maybe that IP address, that 169.254, 169.254 will be very valuable in locating. And then Lambda, again, this gets extra tricky. Now, you can't really do much when it comes to the attacker creating their own function other than seeing that the function was created and then go look at the code if it's still there. But if they're hijacking your Lambda function, something you can ask your developers to do for you is increase the amount of print statements, for lack of a better term, where when Lambdas are executed, Lambda functions are executed, what's captured in CloudTrail is going to be its output, right? So if you're printing things like, Here's the payload that I've received as input, right? To your standard out, that's going to end up in CloudWatch data. So now you can investigate a little bit better than other than the data by default with Lambda, more or less, is, unless you have problems with your function, is execution started, execution stopped. Right? That doesn't really give you a whole lot of insight. So trying to bake that into your code in some way to get more visibility of what's going on in the function would be very valuable. Right. I hit the hour perfectly, right? But I am going to stick around for any questions that trickled in or additional ones you may have. So this is the cycle that we talked about. Research the attack technique. I provided a really quick rundown of, of MITRE ATT&CK just to 
for those that haven't seen it before and how, how valuable that resource can be. Understand the, the attack path, understand what logs should be generated, turn them on, of course. Conduct a sample attack so you can see what that artifact looks like, review that data, and then build a detection around that and put that into practice in your in production environments that you are, in fact, defending. And then, of course, there's a follow-up work, like if you're using a SIM, what would that query look like? Make sure that data is getting to your SIM, all that good stuff that comes along with it. But again, I only had an hour, so I just want to get into the nuts and bolts, get into the weeds a little bit, and talk about what you know how, how you can generate these uh, th these log sources and, and the appropriate data for specific attacks, right? We can go on and on about this if you need to, which we do in SEC 541, All right? And I'm surprised I got the, the, the name right because that's a, quite the lengthy title, Cloud Security Attacker Techniques Monitoring and Detection, which by the way, as a, it, it, I believe the latest SANS course that has received a certification from GX, so the GCTD, which goes live if I have the date right, I wrote it down, March 25th. Right. It's for pre-sale right now. So very shortly, you can be one of the first ones to get that cert. I hope to see you in class. That's all the salesy stuff I'm going to do for right now. <laughs> I do want to mention there tomorrow, there's another workshop uh, from Kat Traxler, designing access to share data sets in the cloud. Sounds awesome. Well, it actually works quite hand in hand with our course, although it's written, I imagine, from a more uh, engineering architecture kind of perspective, supporting the SEC 549 class, right? So you kind of see how our classes kind of play off of each other. I've mentioned a few, not to sell them to you, but just, you know, where to go if that's the type of work that you want to perform in your day job. We've, we've got a course for you in the cloud curriculum. All right. With that, any questions? I'm going to read through what I have here. So please feel free to use the Q&A. Um, so, Ryan, before yeah. you get to the q and I have yes. a first question for you. Sure, this, sure. This webcast that you just presented, is this going to lead into a workshop? Very good question, Lisa, that I think you know the answer to, <laughs> but for everyone else's benefit that does not, yes. Um, we're going to be doing a workshop performing this, this very work, right? We're going to, now, caveat, you are going to have to bring your own AWS account um, SANS does provision accounts to students in many cloud classes, but these workshops get quite large. We don't have that many AWS accounts, but I will do my best to keep it super, super cost efficient for you. Maybe pennies to do this workshop. That's my goal, at least. No promises there, but it's not going to cost you like $100 just to do the workshop. I'm definitely not going to be the case. But what we're going to do is that life cycle, right? We're going to research an attack, figure out how attackers are leveraging that attack against an AWS environment turn on the right logging, we'll attack our sample asset. We're going to have some Terraform, which spins up some resources for you. You'll attack it, and then you'll review that log data and then build a detection based around that attack, right? So you can more easily and more efficiently spot that in the future. Uh, I don't know how many attacks we're going to run through. We have a limited time in the workshops, but at least a handful, right? We'll, we'll be doing that, that, that process. Make sure we have the right log data, attack it, and then analyze that data. Very good question, Laura. All right, so I've got some other ones here. I'd already answered Jin's top question there about the temporary access keys. Uh, Ravi's asking, um, we talk how federated, federated user flow can be hacked, right? I, short on time there, but super, super high level, right? It's, it's a trusted, you know, it's a trust relationship that they're abusing, where if they compromise a trusted entity, a federated account, what have you, they, if they know the, the ins and outs of being able to pivot to that other account, like in AWS in particular, cross-account role assumption, right, could, could be an example here where they access maybe your trusted third party's AWS account in which you've created a role for so they can access your account. If they know the ins and outs, like the name of the role, the account ID that they're targeting, maybe they're laying back and watching how users normally behave, then yeah, they could access your account in that way. Again, all, all, all of that, at least from the API spec perspective, will be tracked by CloudTrail. So much of what we've talked about from a detection standpoint will be very similar, right? Very good question. Um, what's a recommendation to monitor malicious run commands? It, it is, oh, it popped down there for a minute. Uh, oh, there we go. It's used by the operations team heavily and can be used by an attacker. So a lot of this may come down to knowing normal, right? So as you're collecting this data, maybe part of your, you know, detection capability could be, you know, what, what are my users normally executing in my environment or who's normally executing 
specific API calls, right? So we have a known set of engineers that, that use run commands or a known set of operators. So if we see something abnormal, like a, a weird time where these actions are taking place or an IP address that we've never seen before making these run command calls, that could indicate that, yeah, it, it, it looks legit because they're using the service appropriately, yet there's some oddities surrounding the request. You know, some of that context that comes along with these API call actions, right? Um, oh, was the IMDS used in the slide, IMDS version one from Jen? Uh, yes, it was. However, IMDS version two will work much, well, it, it, it functions differently, right? But if you have a local presence on the system, doesn't matter if you're using version one or version two, as long as the attacker knows how to use version two, it's just an extra step for them. Because in version two, they require a few additional things, they being AWS, to interact with their service. You need to first submit a put request to IMDS and some header information to say how long you want a token to be valid for, right? Because you're asking for a token. You get that token and you supply that token as a header value with every subsequent request. But again, it's just knowing how to use the service. If you have the local presence, you're off to the races either way, right? They, there might be a little bit of trial and error at first, like, oh, they're not using version one. I got to pivot to this. They might be a little more noisy, but it'll work just fine. What version two defeats, largely defeats, is a server-side request forgery. Because when you're tricking a web server to execute a command on your behalf, you're likely not changing the HTTP method. You're likely not adding headers, so which is required by IMDS version two. So it will likely break that attack, right? I say likely because nothing's foolproof, but that's why version two was most likely created here, All right? Very good. Um, can I share the takeaway slide again? Yes, I can. There it is. All right. What methods to detect IMDS version two? I, as I stated, uh, looking for those strange HTTP methods, some rogue header values, but more importantly, doing command line logging or just more intrusive host logging to see those interactions. That's ultimately where it's happening at the host. You're not going to see that in API data inside of the cloud environment. All right. Would it be possible to script a tool that may flood the control plane with garbage data to flood the logs being ingested into the SIM of choice? This may inflate the cost and obfuscate the true malicious action. It is possible, very, very possible, right? However, as you saw, API request flooding goes against their um, uh, customer policy. <laughs> I forget the very long name of it off, off the top of my head, but yeah, don't do that as a legitimate user, but uh, you know, real world attackers, again, they don't care about that stuff. So they may, right? Just, just flood you with log data, trying to hide that needle in a much larger haystack. Yep. Is guard duty able to detect advanced attacks? Uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, I say that because I, I have no, no one, unless you work for AWS, has insight into their rule logic, right? You can see, you can see what their rules are, right? What they're trying to identify. And so it's a Google search away, I'll admit. Um, but some of them being more advanced attacks, like one that I really love seeing guard, hitting, hitting guard duty was stolen credentials from IMDS that are being used outside of that system, right? So what I mean by that is you've got an EC2 instance, a VM that has a role attached to it. Credentials are stolen from it. Now, normally that instance will use its own credentials. So the source IP will be that of the instance itself. But if an attacker steals those credentials, they may be using those credentials from elsewhere, right? Where you have a mismatch. The source IP does not match the IP address of the system that owns those credentials. So there's guard duty detections that can point that out for you. It's a very long name. Again, I don't know the name off the top of my head, but one of them ends in inside AWS. Another one ends with outside AWS, which means either there's a, and this is outside your account too, an AWS assigned IP address that's making this call that again does not match that of the instance, or it's coming from anywhere else, right? So those two detections could help identify these attacks as well. Very good question. All right. I did not see anything else pop in. So really the last thing I have is just, uh, you know, if you're interested in this stuff, SANS has a class for you. We have the, the flight plan to help you on your journey to becoming what we deem the cloud security ace, right? And you can see where SEC 541 sits right in the middle here, right? So if you're a uh, cloud security analyst, we welcome you. It's the right class for you for sure. Even engineers, right? To kind of know the ins and outs of what, they need to enable to support their security team, to support their analysts. F wonderful class for you as well. But we, we provide a variety of course offerings here for you as well. 
depending on what roles you are trying to fulfill or maybe what you want to learn, right? Maybe your future self would really appreciate knowing these particular ins and outs of these cloud capabilities to position yourself for a better paying job, a promotion, or just you want to get into this space. We've got plenty of opportunity for you here and really, really hope to see you in one of those courses, right? So that's all I have. Thank you very much. And um, be on the lookout for that workshop that Laura was hinting heavily at me about, uh, which will be happening the first week of April, right? So thank you very much for attending and hope to see you around.